this is Wayne Griffin. This is my channel. And I'm about the project starting with some books that I began writing about eight years ago. After practicing for about 15 before that, that I wish to create to leave my children at least the, the beginnings, the murmurings of leaving my children a more hospitable world than the one that I grew up in, and by world I mean a home, that first and foremost is a child's world, one determined by, determined by how much we permit or do not the world or nature into the home or world of a child, who is our responsibility. And I find that, through my work, to have established itself as the singular greatest factor, the locus, indeed, of everything that I do and say in my life, and with ease and with great personal fulfillment. And so this channel is part of that legacy, or the murmurings of that legacy, that I suppose started in the early part of my life as a child when I became, and I don't wish to distinguish myself, you know, I don't think this distinguishes me from any other child, was acutely interested in the world that I was immersed in. And although we experience this as pain-related guilt, once you dig into that, what you have is a tremendous sense of personal responsibility for your own happiness and for the world around you, tied, whether we like it or not, to what has happened in our entire family history, in our family, in the human family. And so this has emerged as an interdisciplinary study of what I call living creative intelligence in human heritage. Indeed, I'm not the first person to call it that. <clears throat> and to start off this discussion, another chapter in what I call a living school, that hopefully will be enjoyed by a few people over the years. Some nice uh, lemon metal tea. I'm just opened a couple windows to let nature in, and the night admits a lot of celestial energy, just like the night of the year, winter admits a lot of celestial energy. And we're coming into the part of the year winter solstice where we experience the feminine celestial input of creation. And and not when I say feminine I don't mean just about women. I mean about an energy that runs along and intertwined with the entire eternal totality of the strata of cosmic life that we all enjoy and need to to enjoy the fullness of all that is a man and the fullness of all that is a woman and the most familiar correspondence among all that is feminine and all that is masculine. Now you may think that I'm reading a lot into a time of year celebrated with an orgy of consumerism and meat and stress and the coming together of families that will experience often dramatic changes in their lives as families do, as only families can. So I want to start by indicating a definition of living creative intelligence is what a Qigong master once told me, the primary function of every part of the universe. Can you guess what that is? <clears throat> well, we're doing it right now. It's communication, cellular, social communication, not only across time and space and among people of the world and cells of the body, 
but also the communication of the unbounded strata, what I just called the feminine strata of existence. It's a convention. You could call it masculine if you like, just people have called it feminine. The communication of that strata to the conscious mind, our conscious capacity for life, inasmuch as life and sunlight is communicated to a flower in order for it to open up. As the flower opens up to life, so do we open up to the flower of the world. Now that it's going to sound a little poetic to some people, and it's going to sound almost scientific to others, and that's fine. I'm going to talk about some things to do with knowledge, knowledge in our families, knowledge that is helpful to dealing with any problem that we have. And the reason that it's helpful, and the reason that I call it knowledge, is because it's something that we experience all of our lives in our own vitally individual way. Yet, it's communicated and shared among all generations, all people in the world. In fact, shared with life. And that has to do with this primary function of communication. So don't worry if you do or do not understand how I happen to put it. It's a challenge in itself to take something that runs purpose with the strata of existence, something we all can and, and do every day, and attempt to share that and relate that to other people at any time, let alone in a society as fallen and dark as ours. And that's fine. What has fallen will get back up again. Luckily for us, fortunately for us, and fortunately for creation, a very little bit of knowledge goes a long way. This is my home. I live in the news British Columbia and I spend a lot of time writing. I organized my life since I was a teenager to have a lot of time to generate, uh, to take a, as good a stab as I can at establishing a home for myself. And by home, I don't mean something that's acquired by money, though money doesn't detract or shouldn't, I suppose, necessarily detract from it. A, a space in my life populated with relationships, with food and air, that is as good for me on an individual basis as I, as, as I needed it to be. And we're all different. But I want to emphasize this fact that knowledge is something that you already experience. I could write a whole bunch of differential equations describing gravity, or alleged gravity, the motion of objects, whatever. But you understand buoyancy, you understand weight, without anyone having to explain it to you. It's instinctual. You use it every day. And me explaining it to you for the sake of explaining it to you, or getting you to parrot what I happen to say, or to get some gratification that me, Rain, did something for somebody, ha would only bastardize the value of what you already know. My goal is to just respect your intelligence, respect my intelligence, respect our family's intelligence, and to simply direct our attention to something that has something to do with everything that's ever spoken, whichever way it is spoken. And it may seem crazy, but you can actually summarize all of life by the impulse shared by all of creation to expand our capacity for communicating and enjoying all of the benefits and all of the comprehension of all that would communicate life and health and happiness to everyone in the world, each in terms of our own lives and in terms of our own minds and the particular experience that bring, we bring from lifetimes to the world and vitally and necessarily so. The constraints, the bounds of nature, are much less restricted than they are by what, what we've pummeled together from our experience of a very depraved world. The bounds of nature are quite expansive, but they're highly coordinated by and for human happiness on an individual and massive scale. In turn, 
everything we see that's wrong in the world, to the extent that it's strategic, has to strategically focus upon our ability to communicate the traditions of how we enjoy, how we talk about, how we know and experience the communication of life to the cells of our body, to the people in our families, mother to child, father to daughter and son, across vast tracts of time and experience, cause and effect, and also from the unbounded strata of bliss and life, which is the basis of all intelligence, to our conscious minds. And it all works together in a natural economy, both within or in the strata of the inner self, the cosmic life in terms of our life, and across various conglomerations of cells, of words, of knowledge, of culture, of family traditions, and experiences and memories. I'm going to take this in a direction now, but I just want to give you a moment to just kind of feel that out for yourself. This is a feather from a Canadian geese. I don't know why they're called Canadian geese. I mean, they're not Canadian. They're just geese. It's a beautiful feather. And uh, the thing you'll notice about geese is family. They get where they're going by working together. Now, working together is a nice platitude. And it's certainly worthy of any after-school TV special. But working together is something that you don't just force yourself to do. Working together is the natural result of experiencing the communication of happiness from the very beginning, from within our own being, and reflected by families that operate in accordance with life. In India, probably not the only place in India, they have a word for the way that we've learned to live, the way that we know best to live, the way that is most joyful for all of us to live, in our individual way and as families, that enjoys, necessarily so, the bliss of life, that funds the evolution of creation. Which is to say, not the evolution of a bird into a dinosaur, or into a cow, or into a whale, the evolution of our capacity for the fulfillment, the effulgence, the force and the fullness of life that has its unbounded strata and is expressed through every depth of every river of life that passes through our bodies and through the nature around us in a cosmos of communication that we as man can decide to inhibit or to embrace, to honor or to dishonor, to recognize, or to ignore. Something came up today about the flat earth and the dome and the double traverse of Antarctica and so forth, and hear me out when I say that it doesn't, very, it doesn't matter to me very much whether somebody presses a hand against a dome, though I deeply suspect that nobody will do that, or manages to make their way across the Antarctic ring to some other world or to a, the edge of a firmament. But if it gratifies you to think that they could, you're probably not going to listen to me anyway. And that is exactly as it should be, because what the hell do I know? But I'll explain to you why I think that way. It's because of the answer to the question, where are we going and how do we get there? And I'm going to speak in a bit of a platitude again when I say that I think it's self-evident that how we travel 
has a lot to do with where, if anywhere, we get to. And in this great organization of communication and life that has an enormous range of creativity among our families and relationships, a lot of choices, a lot of obligations, and a lot of joy that ultimately would organize all those choices so that they could experience a wealth and a range of creativity unlike anything that the world today can furnish us with or honor in ourselves. It's a great peril to our minds and to our lives as I've recounted ad nauseum throughout, I don't know, over 500 videos now and through 41 books, uh, most of which are about 800 pages long. And I did that in about seven years because nature really inspired me to do that. And I set myself in the way, according to my aptitudes, of enjoying a fund of, of energy and intelligence. Um, sort of like me watching somebody build a house. Um, I'm impressed that they could do it in two months or six months. I could never do that. But a combination of aptitude, inspiration, dedication, and so forth. Craftsmanship. Again, this isn't original to me. It's really important that you find a thing in your life that really is quite incredible. Maybe even something you take for granted at how well you're able to do it, whether it's in the realm of mind or body, emotion, relationship, intellect, um, patience, kindness. I mean, numerous things. Creation around us every day is alive with incredible beauty. And it indicates to me, and here we're talking about talking, we're talking about listening to communication, and what I hear, what you hear, is great. And if, if listening to what I hear in nature has anything to do with what you hear, great, doesn't have to. But what I hear in creation is a level of beauty from the twinkle of the stars, to the rising of the sun, to the sense and memories and destiny that blows on the wind of winter and spring and fall and rustles in the leaves. Songs born aloft those of my very own soul across the ages and hopefully across generations of my own family. Balms for the manifold injuries to the soul. What it says to me is that it beckons us to a level of creativity, an experience of the unbounded fathoms of life and creativity that could assail the very summit of the thought, the living thought of God all around us. And then provided that thoughtfulness, provided that way of life, provided that restoration in terms of our own lives, of the way of man, the order of man. The greatest range of choice of man within the bounds of a happiness without the experience of which we cannot hope to train our minds on any spectrum of creation and hope to succeed as much as we would like. And at this level of life and this way of life has always held out the prospect of traveling through a range of experience, through an awakening and a flowering of our hearts and our families, of a knowing and observing the boundless joy that can float along currents of air and wind and star through generations of our families, though a bubbling brook of the laughter of children, day to day year after year, and season after season. Nuances of creation and the inspired creativity of the human soul that puts us in the way of a thoughtfulness for all that we ourselves might conceive out of the unfathomable depths of our own bliss and that of God Himself. So there is this way in India called Dharma. And it is the way to live that is also the happiest way for families to live, that at certain times were passed down through traditions. That today might seem like an onerous 
responsibilities conferred or foisted upon the shoulders of generations of men and women, but that just happened to be the best thing for everyone because it was wrested from a way of life that honored the happiness of life itself. And the happiness of life it already exists in terms of our greatest aspirations. The son of a potter might be a potter. The daughter of a, an equestrian expert might be an equestrian expert. Although I don't think our ancestors stopped at just these particular tasks, but were, we grew up with a wealth of talents brought to bear upon the conception of children and the conceiving of homes sufficient for children, um, which are not separate activities, and an experience and enjoyment of the economy of body and soul, but the happiness of life, and indeed the prospect of the answering capacity to conceive of a way of life with a joy and fulfillment of creativity that is sufficient for endless generations of our children, and indeed for our own reincarnation on lands, alive as we know today, with herbs and plants that will grow even at the graveside of a departed soul, for whatever may have ailed them, or would ever ail them in their life, or the next. Because nature is under every impulse to communicate and support life and our life, in turn transmitted to the world around us as much as the rays of the sun are translated, transmitted to every flower in the world, to the gladness of every child who wakes with the caress of the rays of the sun upon their, upon their cheek. Now this last part of this discussion deals with our families. In so much as we enjoy the communication across countless generations of our experience and memory of life, of happiness, we also experience the ramifications of our choices to remain in the way of the currents of creation and of our own happiness or not. And when we have not, this has created a necessity to heal, to restore, and to make corrections in how we think and how we live. Ignoring which, we have magnified the insults not only to our own bodies and lives, but an inherited dysfunction through generations of our families that we could see as trauma, sexual abuse, alcoholism, political persecution, famine, um, chronic disease, uh, crib death, early childhood accidents. Now, resolve yourself to these things, though you may well have throughout the course of your life, without even thinking about it, because that's the nature of life, and that's the nature of your genius as a, as a human man or woman. There is no little occasion to consider that our families, like cells of our bodies, in so much as they've experienced a diminished capacity to communicate, a sufficient homes and traditions that honor our life and all life through our families to the degree that we've trespassed upon Dharma, the happy way of life, that humans are born with the joy of articulating, knowing, feeling, experiencing, and sharing with a range of creativity quite beyond that of building a computer or shopping at Walmart, which is fine in itself, that barring that, our families have experienced injuries, almost as though one large constellation of people that exists through time and even into the future. Now imagine if you've ever looked into your own family history, dysfunction, mental illnesses, abuse, domestic abuse, uh, ambivalence, criminal compliance, um, great aversions to looking, even ever being apprised of pain or violence in a family or in society around us. Enormous suggestibility to the, the predatory dogmas that linger like shadows outside our windows, who inveigle their ways into the very traditions that we're supposed to protect our children from the world. As though these traditions, these 
dark traditions are protecting us from the world, which they're not. They're protecting us from ourselves. So we become at war with ourselves, we become at war with one another. And indeed, there are many occasions among our families to, to find some bridges across the generations. Enormous amounts of healing go on every day. But here I'm interested in painting a broad brush that the injuries we suffer are transmitted like life across the generations precisely because it is up to us to do something about it. And it's every bit as creative and joyful a prospect, however painful this world may be, as it ever was when first the world was born. The animals speak of it. The night and day speak of it. The flat earth speaks of it. And more than anything at all, the pain of the world, and of our children, and of the animals, speaks to it to us every day, if we would listen. In fact, it's the primary research tool of all of my work, and even what I'm saying to you now. We can't make people change, but we can listen to them. And that is a very useful activity, to listen to the world, to complement or augment all of our research and all of the things that we're exposing with listening to our families, listening to pain in our bodies, the pain in our minds, the pain in our families, listening to our ancestors. Look into your mother's and father's life, your grandparents' life. How were they? How did they behave? Were they estranged? Were they good friends? Why did one nephew or cousin move to the other side of the world and never talk to their grandfather or uncle or aunt ever again? As unseemly as it may be, this says something. It says all the things that so many children were never able to say. You can listen to that. And in that, in that sorrow lay a depth of bliss, lay a possibility and necessity and an impending regeneration of a truly human way of life through our families. That is everything that we're looking for in the first place. So I'm going to leave you with that leave you to the music of the world around you, wherever you may be, whenever you may be. Considering your own family, magnify that throughout the entire world and wonder not why there are wars and cults, why there is so much deception, so much credulity, so much compulsion, so many strange religions, so much aversion and even immunity to critical thought that would temper the life and the capacity for happiness that all suffering and every impulse of nature aims to restore. Instead of protecting people from it in the name of that happiness or that love or that God or that religion. If you're watching this now, you've, you've seen those contradictions. And in the previous video I talked about whether or not it's up to us to actually do something about it. There's a world to listen to, there's pain to listen to, there's our families to listen to. Pay attention to body language. Pay attention to the omissions as well as the transgressions that exist around us and within us. Pay attention to any niggling guilt, which is pain. Permit yourself to enter into this world the way you were never allowed to enter into the universe through contact with the song of the wind and the stars, though that of your own soul, and permit that nature to enter into your mind. For nothing would prevent it from doing so, but your own invitation. You're as worthy of it as you ever were, as any man or child ever was. Because the purpose of creation is not to punish anybody. The purpose of creation is to restore life. Punishment is to confer upon nature this, the very sadism that we have come to allow to occupy our way of life, to protect us from pain. God is not like that. Nature is not like that. It doesn't cut off its own hand despite its face. It doesn't rob Peter to pay Paul. Life wants to expand. Happiness wants to expand like the breath in your own chest. And I'll just finish by indicating that knowing that so many of us suffer 
and have suffered and maybe will suffer, remember that it doesn't make you wrong to experience pain. In each one of us, nature sees someone capable of experiencing a greater realization of life than we have ever experienced before. The fruit of which is to help everyone in our family experience a greater conscious capacity for life. And we need not place any very strong expectations on what that has to look like. Which puts us at leisure to conceive of a vision of life for ourselves and our families that isn't constrained by any onerous demands upon us. I hope that makes sense to some of you. I hope that I've at least implicitly illuminated something of the vast cellular and social intelligence like a mighty ocean of nature that greets us every day with the friendly wag of a dog's tail. A little imagination, a little thought. In all the experience we've ever had, honed the language of infinite bliss itself to each our own personal attributes, experiences, memories, suffering, sorrow, hopes, dreams, and genius, and reason, and feeling. People in our lives come not to steal our truth from us. They come to relieve us of our ignorance and of our illusions. Let them. Because the things that we've learned to hold on to most are the things we least need. We least need. They are no sacrifice at all. Enjoy them while they're here. Because under the power of the almighty intelligence of nature, everything has its place. In terms of everything that each individual person and family needs to restore their dharma their happiest way of life. And that is a project, though including, that goes far beyond the ice ring and far beyond any dome. In fact, it is of a blood and a power and a pulsing cosmic intelligence. We experience We experience, like that of the prospect of going places that the twinkle of the stars have always dreamed for us. In a co-creation of God and man, mother and father and child, that we only have to look forward to. That beyond every turn lay nothing but a greater realization of a life within and beyond all bounds in terms of ourselves, and a life in terms of ourselves, one within and beyond all bounds of physical existence, a wealth, a, a living riches, that is imminently available, no matter what the state of life or mind of anyone in the world. This is your permission, from my family to yours, from my family suffering to my capacity to listen. From my experience to your experience, and our experience, borne aloft the winds and desires of God Himself, on the currents of eternity, in the seasons of the year, in this life and the next, in a value and power of an unchanging bliss that changes everything as close as our own blood, and of a bliss that relieves us of all danger, of all imminent doom, of all chance of ever failing to pass our greatest, most powerful souls along through all the generations of this world. This is your permission. God bless.